Howdy, folks. This is just a reminder that if you like this content, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially by subscribing. And be sure to hit the bell notification so you always get notified whenever I have a new video. Hope you enjoy this. Hello and welcome to Catholic Answers Live. I'm Cy Kelly, your host. As happy as can be to be here with you on a Thursday afternoon with Jimmy Aiken here. I'm imagining probably some groovy music. Uh, we've got some traditions on Thursday afternoons and... Uh, those are typical things that happen. Also, uh, we usually do Ask Me Anything, and that's what we're doing today. Ask Me Anything. You got a question for Jimmy Aiken, 888 318 7884. I'll tell you what, if you've got a question for Jimmy Aiken, you've got company because already four lines uh, full. We just, well, we have six lines, so that means just two open right now. 888 318 7884. Ask Me Anything uh, should also, should, should maybe have one more A in it. Anyone, uh, anybody can call. Uh, if you're got an advanced question, you got a beginner level question, whatever your question is, Jimmy's happy to take it. 888-318-7884. Just get to it. Uh, that's the advice I would give you. If you have a question, just get to it. <laughs> uh, Jimmy Aiken, senior apologist here at Catholic Answers, author of, look at this pile of books I have in front of me today. The Bible is a Catholic book, Teaching with Authority, A Daily Defense, and this is just part of the Jimmy Aiken uh, library. Also the proprietor of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. Hello, Jimmy Aiken. Mucho hello, Cyril Kelly. Mucho hello. Que bueno. Yeah. <laughs> Happy to see you. Uh, Likewise. And uh, it's Thursday, so I can say what's dropping tomorrow. Uh, it's going to be part one of a two-part look at the Vatican's new norms or rules for examining apparitions and other supernatural phenomena. So as people may know, a couple months ago, the Vatican came out with new norms or new rules on the subject. The rules hadn't been revised um, since 1978, and they decided it was time we need to take a new approach. Things aren't moving quickly enough in terms of getting to usable judgments on apparitions. It's taken forever. Uh -huh. And so they wrote they wrote some new norms to expedite the process, and even though we don't cover this aspect in in the episodes because they were recorded a, a month or two ago, um, wow, have they expedited things? And just since the new norms came out, the Vatican has released four uh, rulings on different apparitions: two positive and two negative. Oh, that's fascinating, Jimmy. I suppose it's one of those things where. There is a kind of kick the can down the road thing, you know, like, I don't want to get this wrong, or it's a big responsibility. Mm -hmm. So there's the, 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 probably some of the incentive is, oh, we'll just wait and see what, how this develops. So uh, let me, do, you, do you know the, the two that were positive? Do you happen to remember which they were, or they were they were both ones that were in Italy and are not well known in the United States. The only one that they released a ruling on that is well known in the United States is a Dutch um, reported apparition from Amsterdam from the mid 20th century called Our Lady of All Nations, and there was a seer named Ida Peerdeman who uh, oh, reported yeah. seeing the Virgin Mary. And this this apparition is the one that wanted the Pope to infallibly define Mary as um, advocate, um, mediatrix, and co-redemptrix. And they would always, advocates of this would refer to it as the dogma, but there's like three Marian titles there. It seems to me that's three dogmas. But, um, but, what they released was a was a, a memorandum from the time of Paul the Sixth, when they had the the then dicastery for the doctrine of the faith look into this, and the experts who looked into it at the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith unanimously said it is not supernatural. Mm -hmm. Not that we can't confirm whether it's supernatural. They said we can confirm it is it's not, not. Oh, yeah. supernatural, which I'm sure is going to come as very unwelcome news to some of the fans of this um, apparition. But it's what they said. Paul VI approved it. And so that's the Church's current attitude towards that one. Yeah, and I guess that's what I was meaning to say about the incentive being to kind of kick the can down the road, because you know you're going to disappoint some people, uh, and, and yeah. nope, that's not fun. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I mean, we have uh, centuries and centuries of revelation, of saints, of uh, beauties in the church, so if, if, some, if our favorite uh, – uh, doesn't uh, turn out to be what we had hoped. Just move on. There's plenty of uh, plenty of uh, 
of, of good in the Catholic Church, but you don't have to get stuck on one thing. Uh, 888-318-7884. I don't know why. I don't know why I'm giving the number. I'm looking down all six lines full. So I, it's time to, go to the, uh, time to go to the phones. Andrew's in Los Angeles listening on the app, the Catholic Answers Live app. Andrew, thanks for downloading the app onto your phone. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Well, firstly, it seems like every time I call, Jimmy is online. But my question is a bit of a two-parter. So my question is, what is it actually that Protestants have against Mary? And how can I give scriptural responses to their objections? Because it seems like many of them have a personal vendetta against her. And of course, I want to be able to defend our Blessed Mother when these attacks come. Well, a lot of Protestants would say they don't have anything against Mary. In fact, the great majority of Protestants would say, I don't have anything against Mary. She was a wonderful, holy woman. She was the mother of Jesus. She was very blessed by God. Instead, what they'll say is that they uh, they don't object to Mary, but they object to what they see as either bad Catholic teaching regarding Mary or bad Catholic practices regarding Mary. And so... There's a whole spate of different teachings and practices that they object to, and I can't, in a short radio question, you know, give you Bible verses to respond to all of them. Um, but to give some examples, like one of the things that many on the po- Protestants on the popular level object to is giving Mary the title of Mother of God. And uh, that's different on the scholarly level, because Protestant theologians, by and large, tend to recognize, no, it is appropriate to call Mary the mother of God. Mary is the mother of Jesus, Jesus is God, therefore, by hypothetical syllogism, Mary is the mother of God. That's a legitimate inference. But on the popular level, that doesn't always translate down. And so uh, there will be Protestants who will say things like, well, she's the mother of Christ, but she can't be the mother of God because that would mean she's older than God, and nobody is older than God. To which a Catholic response is, well, of course, that's not the sense in which we're referring to Mary as his mother. Um, In human terms, A mother is always older than a child, but that doesn't have to be the case in God's case. What it it really means to be someone's mother is to have that person as your child in your womb, and Mary did have the Son of God as her child in her womb. So no, she's not older than Jesus, but she did have him in her womb, and so she was his mother. Um, And with that, Protestant theologians, by and large, would agree. That, but, as I said, this doesn't always translate down to the popular level. To give a practice, so that's a doctrine, to give a practice, um, they object to asking Mary's intercession. And they will uh, object also to asking other saints for their intercession. Sometimes they'll phrase the objection in terms of the rosary, and they'll say, well, don't you know that Jesus said in the, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew, not to, not to have vain repetitions in your prayer? And to give a response to that that's biblical, well, okay, if you actually look at the Greek for what Jesus says, he doesn't say vain repetitions in Greek. He, he uses a word, batalogesite, which means kind of like, st- don't go stammering on. And he's not thinking about the rosary here. He's thinking about pagans who think that they need to wear down the gods by their prayers. They need to just keep praying and praying and praying. And, and that's what he has in mind. But God doesn't have a problem with repetitions. Even if you translate it, vain repetitions, which is not really a good translation, there's the vain part. Not all repetitions are vain, and you can show that, for example, by looking at Psalm 136. Psalm 136 is a litany psalm where there's a recurring refrain. It's like in a song at the end of every verse, there's a refrain 
that people sing? Well, that's how Psalm 136 is, only it's meant to be sung, the psalm is, by two alternating choirs. And so one group of the choral singers in the ancient temple would sing one line, and then the other would sing the refrain. And then the first would sing the next line, and the other would sing the refrain again. The refrain happens to be, his mercy endures forever, or his loving kindness endures forever. The Hebrew word is chesed, but you can translate that different ways into English. But his mercy endures forever will do. And so they're singing God's praises, and they keep saying his mercy endures forever, and it bounces back and forth. They'll praise God for something, and then the other choir will say his mercy endures forever. Well, it needless to say, that refrain gets repeated, and it gets repeated so often that that in some cases, the first choir doesn't even get a whole lot, a whole sentence out before the refrain comes in again. So the refrain even interrupts sentences, and yet this is the inspired word of God. So this ob this is a repetition, but it's obviously not a vain repetition, and that means that's another reason that you can't simply use what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount as a proof text against the Rosary. Now there's lots of other stuff that different groups of Protestants will object to, either regarding Marian doctrine or Marian practice. But we've got lots of resources for you at Catholic.com online for free. So just go to Catholic.com, type in whatever you're encountering an objection to about Mary, and lots of resources will just pop up right there for you for free online. Thank you, Andrew, very much for the call. We have to go to a break. Before I send you to the break, I just want to let you know that the $50 off for our conference ticket go, runs through this month online. So July is the last chance you'll get to use the promo code early and save $50 on your conference ticket if you're coming. The conference, of course, uh, is uh, September 26th through 29th right here in sunny San Diego. What's the theme of it? Learn from me, the pair sermons, and conversations of Jesus Christ. Scott Hahn will be there. Jimmy Aiken will be there. Kimberly Hahn, Father Sebastian Walsh, Dr. Ray Garendi will be there, Dr. William Junker. Check it all out at CatholicAnswersConference.com. All of our other apologists will be there. We'll do the live radio program. CatholicAnswersConference.com. When you sign up this month, use the promo code EARLY and save $50 on your conference ticket. Catholic Answers Live with Jimmy Aiken is coming right back. Underwriting for Catholic Answers Live is provided by Real Estate for Life. Real Estate for Life connects home buyers and sellers to real estate agents while supporting pro life organizations. On the web at realestateforlife.org. Underwriting for Catholic Answers Live is provided by Magnificat. Published monthly, Magnificat features texts of daily mass, prayers, articles, meditations, art commentaries, and more in step with the liturgical rhythm of the church on the web at magnificat.com. Another great podcast on EWTN Podcast Central is Letters from Home. This is your guide through the scripture readings of the Daily Mass with theologians from the St. Paul Center. You can hear this and other faith-filled podcasts from our friends and affiliates around the world, all in one place, all free at EWTN Podcast Central. Visit EWTN.com slash radio and click on Podcast Central today. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. Jimmy Aiken's our guest both hours today. And as lines open up, just call 888-318-7884. That'll get you right into the studio here. And we'll get you on the air to talk with Jimmy with your question. Anybody's welcome to call 888-318-7884. Going to Millbury, Massachusetts. Daniel is in Millbury. Hello, Daniel. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Hello. What's up? Uh, um, I am a... An artist, uh, I really want to do comic books. I've been mm -hmm. starting, I just graduated from college, I just started um, making one. And I want to mm -hmm. make um, more different, like, uh, Catholic comics. So I was wondering, um, it seems to be like a lot of Catholic and Christian media is uh, very sterilized and kind of appropriate for all ages. <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. I want to make... Uh, a comic that has Catholic themes that is um, 
that is a little bit more, I don't know, quote unquote real. I don't know how real you can get with superheroes, but <laughs> that's a, mm-hmm. that's one thing. But I want to know if there is, are good Catholic themes that kind of total line, which is still appropriate, um, not, but not too sterilized, and that are good themes for a good amount of people to read. Well, uh, sure. Um, now, I happen to know something about this area because I, I practiced for years to become a comic book writer artist. And so I've done a lot of comic book art. Um, I haven't published very much of it, but I did a bunch of it. And I also read comic books. And there definitely are are comics that have Catholic themes in them, as well as broader Christian themes. Um, Surprisingly, for some people, one of the comics that has the strongest Catholic themes is the Marvel comic Daredevil. Uh, Daredevil himself is a Catholic, and there are a number of story arcs where Daredevil's Catholic faith plays a prominent role in the story. Like he'll, for example, get injured and then be taken care of by nuns, Catholic nuns and things like that. And so, uh, and there's other, you know, Catholic iconography and things like that 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 appears in in Daredevil stories. Um, So you might check out some of those for ideas about you know, that you might want to use in your own work. Um, there are Catholic themes and broader Christian themes in, in other comic books, too. Uh, I can think of a few years ago, there was a, a particular issue of uh, Batman, where Batman uh, is preparing to get married to Catwoman. And unfortunately, they did a big fake out on us. But in any event, in the build up to the wedding that was scheduled, uh, the Joker, who has an obsession with Batman, decided he wanted to intervene in this upcoming wedding situation. And he, he by killing people, he lured Batman into a church. And it was obviously a Catholic church from the iconography that was there. And he then holds himself hostage and insists he like puts the gun under his own chin and and holds the Joker holds himself hostage in order to be able to talk to Batman. And Batman has a no killing ethic. So he goes along with this, and the Joker starts talking about how, you know, and the Joker's memory of his own past is confused. You know, he, as the Joker says in, um, in one of his appearances, if I've got to have a history, I'd prefer it to be multiple choice. Well, at the moment, he's remembering that his mom was a Catholic. At least that's what he remembers. And he talks about St. Augustine, and he insists holding himself at gunpoint that Batman get down on his knees next to the Joker and the two of them pray to God together. And so the Joker is on his knees. He's holding himself hostage. Batman gets down on his knees too. There's a moment of silence. And then Batman says, amen. And it's a, it's a very moving scene where Batman actually prays to God with the Joker and so there are Christian and Catholic themes in comic books, um, you know, with a, a little knowledge of the territory. Like I've just given you a couple of pointers. There's this particular issue of Batman that's like this. There are multiple arcs in Daredevil that are like this. Uh, you can find themes that you might want to explore in your own work. So it, without it being, you know, just all strictly for kids. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, I hope it is helpful as well, Daniel, but I'm going to just leave it there because uh, lines are full and I would like to get as many on as I can with Jimmy today. Uh, Another Daniel in Noonan, Georgia, now watching on YouTube. Hello, second Daniel. Uh, Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. All right. Um, How do we know that the woman of Revelation 12 is the Virgin Mary? Because it it appears in some parts that it is, but in other parts it seems to be talking about Israel or something else entirely. Yeah. So um, one of the things that you discover when you read uh, Revelation and study its symbolism closely 
is that the vision in Revelation uses what you can call polyvalent symbols. These are symbols that have more than one thing that they point to. An early example of that is the four living creatures that John sees around the throne of God. And the way he describes the four living creatures, it's clear that they incorporate elements both of Isaiah's seraphim, who Isaiah sees around God's throne, and Ezekiel's cherubim that Ezekiel sees around God's throne. And so the vision in Revelation is drawn on both the seraphim and the cherubim and is incorporating their characteristics into the four living creatures that John sees. And so the four living creatures seem to point to both the seraphim and the cherubim. Later on in Revelation, in Revelation chapter 17, John is seeing uh, a vision of a beast with seven heads, and he's told flat out the seven heads are seven kings and seven mountains. So they point to two different things. They point to a group of kings, and they point to a group of mountains. So we see that Revelation incorporates this polyvalent imagery, and bearing that in mind, what are we to make of Revelation 12? Well, I think an open-minded, fair person taking a, a read at, of Revelation 12, knowing that it, the book incorporates this symbolism, we see this woman, and she gives birth to Jesus, to a child who's obviously Jesus the Messiah. Um, you know, he's gonna, he's destined to rule the nations with a rod of iron. That's a messianic symbol, and so this, we see this woman giving birth to the Messiah. Psychelet, who? What woman gives birth to the Messiah? That would be Mary. Yeah, duh. So it seems clear <laughs> there's a there's a reference to Mary in this symbol, but this woman also is um, is clothed in the sun. She's got the moon at her feet, and she's wearing a crown of 12 stars on her head. Psychelet, can you think of any passage in the Old Testament, like maybe in the second half of the book of Genesis, that involves the sun, the moon, and 12 stars? Jimmy, I'm so sorry. I was looking ahead, and <laughs> you got me. That's you got okay. me reading it's, questions it's, ahead. It's, 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 one of jo- it's one of Joseph's dreams, oh, yeah. where the sun and the moon represent his father and mother, and the 12 stars represent the 12 sons of Joseph, although at the moment he sees 11 of them. But um, this is imagery that, based on Genesis, is associated with the nation of Israel. So we see that the woman also can be understood in terms of Israel. And thus far, I mean, in terms of my explanation, you know who agrees with that? Pope Benedict XVI. He would say, yeah, in one sense she's Mary, but she also represents Israel. And it can go beyond that, because one of the things we see in Revelation 12 is a conflict between the woman, her seed, that's Jesus the Messiah, and the serpent, which is the devil. Psychelet, can you think of any passages that involve a, a conflict between a woman, her seed, and a serpent, maybe in early Genesis? I'm so glad you came back to me, because I was paying attention this time. <laughs> that would be Eve. <laughs> yeah, in, in Genesis 3. Yeah. And so there's another sense in which this woman could be understood in terms of Eve, the old Eve, the original Eve, or the new Eve. And so this woman looks like she can have several different reference, and we don't have to pick between them and say, oh, it's definitely this one and not any of those others. No, it can be all of them. Uh, Daniel, again, I'm going to leave that there uh, because we have not had an open line yet, or I should say as they open up, they are filled immediately. And I got caught reading ahead to see what the questions are, so I know they're really good. Uh, so I've uh, on we go. Uh, Daniel, thanks very much for that call. Bob is in Poplar Bluff, Missouri, listening on the EWTN app. I hear, I hear they've got poplars on their bluff there. They, they do. It's a very popular place yeah, to visit as well. But anyway, here in Arkansas, uh, here in oh, Arkansas, was, we have Pine Ridge. Oh, I'm sorry. I was hoping that perhaps there would be a concordat of some sort uh, if there's a ban on the traditional Latin mass uh, between the two groups of the Novus Ordo and the traditional Latin mass to have a continuation of discussion. Also, when you were talking about Mary, um, 
<laughs> Mary herself represents Israel. Well, Bob, uh, I, I, so, okay, Bob, what's your question for me? Oh, my question is, do you feel a uh, concordat would be appropriate or some sort of uh, uh, negotiated uh, settlement or agreement? Regarding the Latin Mass? Uh, well, um, Between so, the Latin Mass and the Novus Ordo, because they are in a very stressful situation right now. No, I agree that I agree with that, and the the Latin Mass community has my sympathies. I hope that the current rumors just turn out to be rumors, um, and that there aren't further restrictions. But what I do not foresee happening is a complete ban. Uh, there are certain religious institutes like the Priestly Fraternity of Saint Peter and the Christ the King Institute that are devoted to say in the Latin Mass, and that is not going to change. Um, Pope Francis has met with the leaders of these groups and has encouraged them to continue their mission, and it would it would be a massive undertaking to try to uproot that, and he's not going to try that. So the real uh, area where there's space for concern is in, is in uh, Masses and that are celebrated in the traditional style that are not by priests of those organizations. And I'll have a little more to say about that on the other side of the break. Hang on, Bob, and everybody else who's on the line. Jimmy Aiken is our guest. It's Ask Me Anything. We'll be right back with more on Catholic Answers Live. What was the church like in its infancy? In a word, Catholic. And Joe Heschmeyer has the receipts. In his best-selling book, the early church was the Catholic Church. He gives you the details from the historical records of the first two centuries of Christianity. Right now, get a copy for just $10, plus free shipping if you live in the continental United States. Get more information and order The Early Church Was the Catholic Church at theearlychurchwascatholic.com. Is orthodoxy an alternative to the Catholic Church? In a time of uncertainty for many Catholics, orthodoxy can look like greener pastures. Answering Orthodoxy, the new book from Catholic Answers Press, explains why Catholics who are thinking of leaving need to think twice. There are important reasons to remain in the Catholic Church and convincing answers to Orthodox claims. Order your copy of Answering Orthodoxy today at shop.catholic.com or ask for it at a good Catholic bookstore near you. Why We're Catholic is the one book you can hand to anyone to invite them into or back to the Catholic faith. With more than 400,000 copies sold, Trent Horn's book has had a number one ranking on Amazon.com for five years running. Now available in softcover, bulk cases, ebook, and on Audible. Find out what the excitement is all about. Order your copies of Why We're Catholic at shop.catholic.com or at a good Catholic bookstore. Visit whywe'recatholic.com. Our Lord needs articulate defenders of the truth to spread the joy of the Catholic faith. Catholic Answers Monthly Giving Club, Society 315, helps you fulfill the call in 1 Peter 315 to always be prepared to make a defense for the hope that is in you. For as little as $10 a month, you'll help Catholics grow in faith, bring lapsed Catholics home, and lead non-Catholics to the truth. Go to casociety315.com and join today. Matt Swaim here. Tomorrow on the Sunrise Morning Show, we'll be live again from the National Eucharistic Congress in Indianapolis with Father Patrick Briscoe, Liz Lev, and more. Now back to Catholic Answers Live. A little bit of groovy music for you. Jimmy Aiken, our guest. It's Ask Me Anything. Anyone can ask whatever they like of Jimmy Aiken today, 888-318-7884. Uh, the phones are freakishly full. Uh, it just seems like when one goes, another comes right in. So on we go. Uh, no, 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 no. Oh, I'm we, going back to Bob. To... Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Um, uh, Bob in Poplar uh, Bluffs, Missouri. I wouldn't forget Poplar Bluffs. Uh, uh, I, you're st I assume you're still there with us, Bob? Oh yeah, I had okay. a couple of comments real well, quick. No, Bob, yeah, we no, got to no, get no, we got to no, let Joey. This, I mean, this, we got to let uh, Jimmy finish his answer. Yeah, this is this is a Q and A show, not a comment show. So I'm happy to answer questions, but 
we don't really do comments here. Um, so in terms of, sh of masses celebrated in the traditional style that are not celebrated by priests who belong to religious orders or institutions that are devoted to the traditional liturgy, that's where the real potential for further restrictions exists. Now, I hope that doesn't happen. I, I rejoiced when Pope Benedict XVI uh, liberalized the celebration of the traditional liturgy. I thought that was great. I think it. I, I think that I, although I understand some of the reasons that Pope Francis wanted to restrict it, I wouldn't do that. I would like to see us get back to a situation where there is a a generous uh, application of the celebration of the traditional liturgy. I'm all for that, but. I do recognize that the Pope has the authority to further restrict the celebration of the liturgy in that form. I hope and pray he does not. Um, I think it would be counterproductive for him to do that. I think it was counterproductive for him to do this. Um, and I think it would be further counterproductive for him to restrict it further. Having said that, you asked Bob in terms of a concordat, and a concordat is an agreement that exists between parties that are equal, like nation states. And so the Vatican has signed concordats, the Vatican, Vatican City being a nation state, has signed concordats with various other governments at different points in its history. I don't really see a concordat itself applying in this situation because the Vatican is not negotiating with equals here. You don't have two groups that have equal stand and that could sign such a document. But if the you also said or something else to continue the dialogue, absolutely I'd be all in favor of that. I think that'd be great if there are further uh restrictions on the celebration of the traditional liturgy, or even if there aren't, I think that this conversation should be ongoing and that that's the path towards um, resolving the issues that need to be resolved. I also think certain YouTube influencers who have given the traditional liturgy a bad name need to shut their mouths because that's part of where this problem is coming from. And people who appreciate and enjoy the celebration of the traditional liturgy need to express their thanks to Pope Francis and their support for Pope Francis. Because if, 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 if you got someone who can take away something that you very much value, you need to thank them for not doing that. You need to you need to give them positive reinforcement. That's just simple diplomacy. And so, rather than following some of these YouTube influencers who I could easily name that are stirring up trouble in this area, they need to instead deluge the Vatican with messages of support and appreciation and say, thank you so much, Pope Francis, for allowing us to have this. We really value it. We're praying for you. Um, be nice and you get more of what you want. So that's that would be my advice. But uh, yeah, I think the conversation should continue, whether or not there, there are forthcoming restrictions. Bob, thank you uh, very much. Debbie's in New York. Uh, Debbie, thank you for waiting. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy Aiken. No? No, Debbie? Uh, you got line six? No? Okay, uh, Debbie, I'll tell you what, I'm going to put you on hold, and we'll check and see if you're still there, and we'll, we'll, we'll get you on if you're still there. Let's go to Miami, Florida, where Chris is listening on the Catholic Answers Live app. Chris, welcome. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Hey, Cy. And I wanted to say that you both and everybody over there have a bunch of friends here in Miami, and if you ever want great Cuban food, we got you covered. Just come by down. But, uh... All right, thank you. Because I do want great Cuban food. I just want you to know that. And next time in Miami, I will find you, Chris. You better, man. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, so here's my question for you, Jimmy. I heard uh, an mm -hmm. episode, a great episode you did on Mysterious World about um, remote viewing, and mm -hmm. it was great. And a couple weeks ago, I heard you mention about some remote viewers who saw Jesus. And they didn't know it was mm -hmm. used at the time, but they saw them. Can mm -hmm. you elaborate on that? Because I was trying to explain it to my brother, but I didn't really know. I couldn't say much about it. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? 
Okay, so uh, this is, and I've got a video of this on, uh, I believe, on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. But this is a story that is told by a remote viewer who worked for the Defense Department named Lynn Buchanan. Uh, Lynn Buchanan says that back during the days when the Stargate program was active, he was given a target. He did not know what the target was because remote viewers are supposed to be blind to what they're being asked to view so that their conscious mind can't interfere with the impressions they're receiving. And he didn't know this was a practice target. They had some sessions that were practice, just for practice, to stay in practice, and some sessions that were operational. And he didn't know that he was being given a practice target. But the practice target was Jesus. And what he perceived was a man who looked Jewish to him, and he seemed to be in modern dress, but he perceived a man who looked Jewish to him, and the man looked back at him and, like, perceived him, and the man seemed completely innocent, and he thought this might be an operational session and that he was being asked to view um, like someone who might be a criminal or a terrorist or something like that. But he got this overwhelming sense of this man is innocent. And the man looked at him and he felt like, if I recall correctly, Lynn just felt like he felt accepted and loved and so forth. And And when he came out of the session, he said, I don't know what you guys think that man did, but he's innocent. And that's when they told him it was Jesus. And Lynn said it 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 rocked his boat, and it uh, it you know it was very meaningful to him to to learn that that's who he had been viewing, and to have had that experience of Jesus. What do you think? Of, Excellent. Yeah, that's the one you were looking for, huh, Chris? That's it. That that, that answers it well. I'm gonna make sure that my brothers hear this. And um, thank you very much. All right. No problem. See you in Miami, Chris. Uh, if someone invites you to Miami for Cuban food, you just got to find a way to get there. I, I don't. It, it seems like an expensive trip for some free Cuban food, but I will find a way. Is Debbie back? Is that okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Debbie in New York, uh, thank you very much for your call. Uh, go ahead with your question for Jimmy Aiken. Hello. Hi, um, Debbie. I'm just wondering, what is the Catholic Church's um, stance on cremation versus just the traditional burial? Well, uh, the Catholic Church permits cremation. Now, in the past, there were some folks who apparently advocated cremation as a sign that they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. It's like, I guess the reason, and was like, haha, I'm going to be cremated so God can't put me back together. Well, that's not going to stop God from putting you back together. He has infinite power, and it doesn't matter how far you scatter your the components of your body, God can put you back together. I mean, back in the ancient world, they didn't always use cremation, but it's right there in Genesis. Dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. Your body decays. They put you, oftentimes they just put you in, a, in an open pit in the ground in some cultures, and your body would decay, and the parts would get scattered, and that's not going to stop God from putting you back together. So, in any event, as long as you're not doing cremation for uh, as a sign of I don't believe in the resurrection or something like that, well, then you can do it. Um, it the Catholic Church permits it. It's not a problem. Uh, there are regulations about what you then do with the cremated remains, and the current regulations are that they need to be kept together rather than scattered. A lot of people want to scatter them. And typically, they need to be kept together in a, in a container uh, in a location that where people go to pray because they don't want the name of the person forgotten. They don't want, they want the soul of the person to, uh, they want something to remind people to live in to pray for the dead. And recently, there was a slight modification of those rules to where you can mix at least a portion of the cremated remains, or cremains as they're called, with other cremated remains as long as you, may, you in some way maintain the, the person's name. Uh, 
Like if you're if you if you're going to put a bunch of cremated remains together in a mausoleum, you want a list in the mausoleum of whose cremated remains are here so that people can pray for those people. Now, this is the church's current regulations. This is not a matter of divine law. It's not a matter of divine law that you have to keep the remains together, but that's the current Catholic practice for when a Catholic chooses cremation. Debbie, I'm glad we got to speak with you. It, you brought us right up to the break, so we will leave it there. We'll be right back with more Jimmy Aiken. Ask me anything on Catholic Answers Live. Hello, this is Archbishop Salvatore Cordelioni of San Francisco. Keep your dial tuned to Catholic Answers Live. In Morse code, the sequence SOS is a distress call. It's been said that it stands for Save Our Souls. Well, right now our world is in big trouble, and we're putting out an SOS call for help. Will you answer that call? St. Paul Street Evangelization, a Catholic nonprofit, has hundreds of teams who share the good news with souls who don't know Jesus. Catholic Answers is supported in part by St. Paul Street Evangelization. Visit streetevangelization.com to get involved. EWTN is everywhere. EWTN radio programming is provided free of charge to over 500 domestic and international AM and FM radio stations. It's a great teaching tool for Catholics and non-Catholics alike. For a complete list of EWTN AM and FM stations across America, visit EWTNradio.net. At the bottom of the page, click Affiliates. EWTN is the Global Catholic Network. Just one call after another when Jimmy Aiken is here. Lots and lots of folks on the line. It's Ask Me Anything, and we're going to Sweden next. Uh, that's always nice when we get a call from Sweden. Pear is watching on YouTube in Sweden which at uh, what I would guess is about midnight, but I didn't look it up. Uh, Pear, you there with us? I'm here. Thank you, gentlemen, for taking my call and your uh Correct that it's uh, almost uh, 1 a.m. over yeah. here oh, well, in the middle of the night. But Thanks for staying good, up. Good quail. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, uh, you too, sir. <laughs> good evening. Thank you. And uh, so uh, I should get to my uh, my question. Um, uh, I would like to have uh, Mr. Aiken's uh, thoughts on um, the uh, events over the, the weekend with the assassination attempt uh, on uh, President Trump. And mm -hmm. uh, if you see any connections with the uh, operations at Fatima, uh, especially since the uh, the secrets of Fatima was revealed on the same date, the 13th of July, back in 1917. And, okay. Uh, by the way, I might, might have a follow-up uh, if there's time. Uh. Okay. Okay. So, in regard to your first question, I don't really see any connection. Now, I do see parallels in that the third secret of Fatima involved an assassination attempt, but I also see lack of parallels. Like um, the the victim of the assassination attempt in the third secret of Fatima was the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, not a former president of the United States. Also, the third secret dealt with um, the efforts, the actions of communists. And it was widely believed at the Vatican that after Mehmet Aliaga uh, shot um, Pope John Paul II, that he was that he was in the employ of communist agents and that this was a gambit in the Cold War. Well, you know, they've they've got the phone of the shooter who shot at President Trump. And he doesn't seem to have been a communist, and it doesn't, at least as far as we know, he doesn't seem to have been in the pay of anybody. So I don't see, um, I see more differences than I see similarities here. Uh, it's true that uh, this happened on the 13th of July, but the, you know, the, the apparitions at Fatima, they tended to happen on the 13th of various months for like six months. And so there are, you know, something has happened in the world on the 13th of every month. And every once in a while, by 
random chance, it's going to be an, an assassination attempt, including on the 13th of July. So I don't see anything here that would go beyond just random chance in terms of connecting it to the apparitions at Fatima. Uh, Fatima's focus is fundamentally different, and at least based on what we know now, it seems to me like this is just a chance coincidence rather than something that was envisioned in the or embedded in the third secret of Fatima. Uh, Pear, you stayed up till the middle of the night in Sweden, so I'd be happy to let you have a follow-up. Okay, thank you, and uh, thank you for that answer. Perhaps it's uh, a future Mysterious World episode, who knows? Uh, who knows? My second uh, part of, the, of this uh, question uh, has to do with a, a viral clip that's been uh, going around uh, after the, uh, the event on, on Saturday. Uh, it's um, on YouTube originally, and it was uh, published back in uh, April. And mm -hmm. it's a Protestant uh, prophet, uh, so proclaimed, uh, where he describes uh, the assassination attempt in, in uncanny detail. Uh, so uh, he seems to have had some type of vision. Uh, do you have any comments on this clip, uh, if you are aware of, of the clip I'm, I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah, I'm aware of the clip, and I'm likely to be discussing it on Monday on uh, Cameron Bertuzzi's channel, Capturing Christianity, on YouTube. Uh, Cameron's having me on to talk about prophecy, including stuff like this. But I'll give you my impression right now, because I am familiar with the clip. Um, what this gentleman, his name is, he goes by the handle Bible Brandon, so I guess his, one of his names is Brandon. And he, I don't know his full name. And he says, said several months ago that he saw an assassination attempt on President Trump and that he saw a bullet go by his right ear and that it then blew out his eardrum, causing blood to be on his face. And that's not quite what happened with President Trump, uh, but it's, it's close enough. Um, one of the things the Catholic Church recognizes is that the seer's consciousness, when someone's receiving a vision, will interpret what they're seeing. And Brandon has since come out with another video where he said, I interpreted the blood as being due to a ruptured eardrum, and it turns out it was really, his ear got punctured. Um, you know, the, the, the exterior of, of his ear. And and so I wouldn't hold that against him. I mean, it's quite notable to say there's going to be an assassination attempt on President Trump, and it's going to be a bullet go right by his ear and even intersect his ear or hurt him in some way, and he gets blood on his face. That's notable. What he then goes on to say is that he saw President Trump and this get down on his knees and really become a fervent believer in Christ. And so he would have a conversion experience. And that doesn't mean, you know, the way I would read it, that wouldn't mean at this moment. I mean, he, President Trump did get down, but to avoid the bullet, not to have a religious conversion. But that doesn't mean he's not going to have a religious conversion in the future. Um, and then he said that, if I recall correctly, that he saw an economic collapse in the United States and things like that. Um Okay, fine. Maybe stuff like that will happen in the future. I'm open to that. I don't dismiss the idea that this gentleman, you know, received a vision or had a, prophet, a precognitive experience or something like that. But I also see reasons for caution here because I've looked at some of the other videos on his channel and they are not as impressive. They use a tactic that is similar to what professional mediums will use that's a form of cold reading. Cold reading is where you don't um, do specific research on a person, but you throw up a bunch of possibilities. Like if a, if a medium is, let's say they're talking to a whole group of people, they may say, I, I sent someone here has lost someone whose name begins with J. And someone here has recently lost a father and someone and they'll name a whole bunch of things. And when they throw out a whole bunch of possibilities, some of those are going to be hits. If you're talking to a group of people who have come to see a medium, probably someone lost someone whose name begins with J because J is a very common letter that names begin with in English. And probably someone lost a father 
because they're here to see a medium. And so just by throwing out a bunch of options, um, some of them are going to be hits by random chance. And what I saw Bible Brandon doing in another video that's more recent is he starts speculating on what the Democrats are going to do. And he throws out bunches of different options. The video is titled something like Kamala Harris replaces Biden question mark. It's something like that. And it only came out nine days ago. But when you finally when he finally gets to what he saw in his vision about this, he says, oh, yeah, there was uh, God said, you need to watch Kamala Harris and you need to watch Gavin Newsom, and you need to watch Christine Whitmer, and and I also saw a woman with uh, with short blonde hair. I don't know if it was this woman, or I don't know if it was Hillary Clinton, but God showed me something involved. And so he's just laying out bunches of different scenarios, and no matter what happens, the odds are pretty good that one of those scenarios is going to be correct. But he's just he hasn't. He hasn't been specific here. He's just saying there's a whole bunch of stuff to watch here, but God didn't tell him beyond showing him this this imagery. And so this makes his prediction likely to be true by random chance alone. And since this is a known technique that scam artists use in other areas, like in mediumship, I this is a red flag for me about this guy. So yeah, maybe he I haven't researched his history thoroughly, but if this is the mode he normally operates in, then he's probably been spinning lots of conflicting scenarios over the course of his channel and by random chance one of them happened to be right. So I I, ha, I although it's a notable hit for him to have the perception of Trump's assassination with a bullet going by his ear. It's not a perfect hit. It's a notable hit. But given the operation, the mode of operation I see him in, he just throws out so much stuff that if that's his normal mode of operation, he would he would get the assassination by random chance. And so I don't see anything here at present, based on my present level of study, that would suggest anything more than random chances at work here. Though I'm open. Pear, thanks very much. Uh, we're getting uh, calls from Europe today, so off we go to Portugal now. Uh, Rafael, oh. Rafael in Portugal watching on YouTube. Glad you're here, Rafael. Uh, go ahead with your question for Jimmy. All right. Hello. Hey, Jimmy. Um, so I've recently read um, some controversies on the canonization of Jose Maria Escriva, mm -hmm. and um, apparently a lot of testimonies, negative testimonies, were not heard. And mm -hmm. so, do you know any details about that, and could a canonization fail, meaning um, he was not in fact a holy man, and uh -huh. I'm gonna let um, Jimmy answer. what would it mean? Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, Rafael. Okay. Just we're getting close to the so, end of this hour. So, so in terms of uh, in terms of Jose Maria Escriba, I don't know the details of his canonization. I know that I know that he there was some controversy about him and his organization Opus Dei, but I don't know what was and was not allowed to be heard in his canonization process. So I can't really comment on that. When it comes to the question of does a canonization guarantee? that someone is holy, well, what a canonization is meant to guarantee is that they're in heaven. And so you could have someone who wasn't particularly holy in their life, but if they if they died in God's friendship, then they're in heaven and they're a saint, and that's what canonization is meant to do. Does it always work? Well, there's a dispute about that. Many people are of the opinion that saint canonizations are infallible. And so if the Pope declares someone a saint, it is absolutely guaranteed that they are in heaven. However, there's also another opinion that was shared, for example, by Cardinal Avery Dulles, and I favor this opinion myself, and there are some in the traditionalist movement who also favor this that say, you know, the question of did someone die in a state of grace is not close enough to it's it's not something that's essential to defend anything in the deposit of faith that Jesus gave us 
someone, whether they're in a state, uh, and that's what you need for the church to teach on something infallibly. It either needs to be something that's in the deposit of faith or something that's necessary to defend something that's in the po- the deposit of faith. And whether someone is in a state of grace when they die, it doesn't look like that's necessary to defend something in the state of grace, and in, it's certainly not in the state of it's certainly not in the deposit of faith itself, and so um, so it doesn't look to me or Cardinal Dulles or some in the traditionalist movement like we have adequate grounds for infallibility here. But there is a different opinion, and the opinion that saint canonizations are infallible is the more common opinion historically. Oh, thank you so much, Raphael, for the call from Portugal and for getting that question out quickly. I'm sorry if it seemed like I was moving you along, but as you can hear, we are at the end of the hour. The number is 888-318-7884. Jimmy Aiken is our guest, and it's Ask Me Anything. If you've got a question for Jimmy Aiken, whatever that question might be, you are welcome to pick up the phone and call. We're going to take a very quick break, so if you're on the line, hang on the line. If you haven't dialed yet, there may be one or two lines open as we go to the break. 888-318-7884. And before we go, just one more reminder that if you like what you've watched, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially by subscribing. I'm trying to grow my channel, and I'd really appreciate your help. Thank you, and God bless you.